Happy Migraine Awareness Month, everyone. We are meeting so many amazing and interesting people who are thriving with migraine. Uh, and one of them is actually somebody who's pretty inspirational to me. And I'm pretty stoked that she's here to join us. Julia Banks, thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, it's so good to be here. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, I want to talk about the exciting bit first. Can we talk about your new book, Power Play, first? <laughs> yes, we can. So it's, um, I finally finished it. I've got my author's copy, like it's been printed, um, and it'll be mm -hmm. in bookshelves first week of July. So um, it's very exciting. It's called Power Play, Breaking Through Bias, Barriers and boys clubs mm -hmm. and interestingly I do mention migraine in um in the book so in the book in the we book we get a mention yay <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah all yeah. right so is it mostly about your time in parliament or do you talk about the other stuff you did as well no because my time in parliament was like I had five years in politics and a lot of mm. people don't realize that I actually only joined um, the Liberal Party in 2015 and a year later um, I was elected in a marginal seat that they thought was unwinnable, um, which actually became the one seat and the one seat majority. Um, mm -hmm. And I served under Turnbull's leadership. Um, and after the coup against Malcolm Turnbull, I um, announced I was going to recontest. And mm -hmm. then uh, three months later, I um, announced that I was going to the crossbench and... Um, mm -hmm. And then six months later, I ran unsuccessfully, unfortunately, as an independent in the 2019 election. Yeah. So that I'm was sure my... there were a lot of people in the migraine community that really did wish you would have won. Um, <laughs> so for those not aware, Julia actually ran against Greg Hunt. Um, <laughs> that would mean that Greg Hunt would not be the health minister right now. Um, that's not to say that we might have got somebody worse, but... Um, you know, there is a, a little bit of a, a personal fixation on Greg Hunt. I mean, you know, he gave us Gallaty, thank you, but it's been a very long fight. Anyway, yeah. back to the story. Well, actually, speaking so, of Greg Hunt too, in that context, like the vision was, you know, that the independents would have the balance of power. So we get sensible mm. things done on climate change action, on gender equality, and in, in relation to health as well, you know, that would, would have been the aim, regardless of who the minister was um yeah my you know i i couldn't believe it but it was the first parliamentary friendship group for women's health that i that i set up when um during my term um and it was sort of like oh yeah okay right you can set that up so you know it depends on the focus of of the um of the independence but you know you do have a lot of power if you if you have the balance of power as an independent you don't have those constraints of the major party but um mm. but my the book getting back to the book it's really about because i had five years in politics 25 yep. in the legal and corporate sectors um and so mm. it's it's not to say that those areas are perfect and it is true to the subtitle in terms of like you know i didn't want to the book to just be an analysis of um, the dysfunction of a major party. I wanted it to be about something useful for women to use mm -hmm. in the workplace who aspire to leadership positions. Yeah. Well, looking forward to reading it. Now, obviously, your time in Parliament wasn't much fun. Um, you know, there's a lot of misogyny in that place. And, and obviously, in the past, I've had a bit of work to do there. My stepmother was a senator. So none of that was surprising to me. But I think people... Uh, in the last couple of months in particular, I have started to realise that actually the culture in that place is very toxic. Was it worthwhile? Um, it was worthwhile in the sense that, well, I think it was worthwhile and I hope my book speaks to people across the sectors and it was worthwhile in the sense that um, any sort of bias, barriers or um, discrimination that I've experienced throughout my legal and corporate sector, corporate experience, not just my stories, but other women's stories, was probably amplified times 50, um, <laughs> maybe even times 100 within the context of, of Parliament House. And I think um, it, it's never really been exposed or, you know, never really been compelled to do something but under the certainly under the Morrison leadership that entrenched anti-women culture has become more entrenched and I think um 
that has encouraged um, a lot of uh, vocal input, um, particularly this year, as we've heard. In terms of the worthwhileness of being um, a member of parliament, the really worthwhile part often doesn't get reported in, in the press. So for me, it was, it was really huge that I was able to be that advocate for gender equality while I was there. Um, but you know, notwithstanding the constraints of working in a major party, but also, but particularly after I um, made the move, but all the local constituent work that you're able to do mm. to get the bells and whistles publicity is, you know, there's no other job which would allow you to do that um, mm. when you're dealing with the real people in your electorate. Um, that's pretty amazing and very rewarding. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So I've got a bit of a question for you. By law of averages, there should be about 50 members of the federal parliament across both chambers that live with migraine. Did any of them while you were there ever tell you that they also have migraine? Only one. Or do they hide um, it? Only one? Only one on, on my side, uh, you know, in the Liberal Party. And it was mm. just by chance. I almost had to tease it out of him. He's a mm. guy I really respect. And um, he walked past me one day and he looked really pale. And I said, are you okay? And he said, oh, no, I've got a migraine. And you know how migraine sufferers know that people, there's a very annoying people who get a headache, say I'm getting a migraine. Mm -hmm. Look, when a migraine, mm -hmm. when a fellow migraine sufferer is getting a migraine, you know that they're, you intuitively know that they're a migraine sufferer. And he yeah. was, and it was almost like he was, you know, sort of a bit reluctant to, to tell me, but we'd work closely together on a few things and um, have, quite a high mutual respect for each other. And um, and he, it was almost like I was one of the few people he'd spoken to about it because I was telling him about how I handle my migraines and, you know, mm. I did have a huge uptake of migraines during my term. Um, and uh, it was quite interesting. He said, oh, I should try that, you know, so it was really interesting. Mm. Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about your migraine. When did it start for you and what are your symptoms? Um, so migraine, I had my first migraine after the day after my um, HSC or year 12 exams. And mm. I used to get them quite, not, not regularly, but I, I, I sort of self-diagnosed them as weekend migraine or post-stress migraines. And my mother used to get them in that way and so did my brother so I had that sort of family experience of it I like I knew how bad they were uh, and then they sort of increased with um, pregnancy and mm. even actually before pregnancy it was they increased during my working life in in um, in frequency in terms of mm. and, and I'd always related to a, a poor sleep or lack of sleep that was always a big mm. trigger for me so stress at work don't, I don't sleep and then um, I don't get or I don't get enough sleep and then um, you know it's all bad um, I remember my worst one was I was so bad um, that I, call, I got home from work and I called my brother who's a GP who suffers from migraine and he could tell by the tone of my voice he had to come over and I literally had to crawl to the front door to open it for him and he gave me mm. 15 at that time and but I do recall once they increased in frequency I remember actually telling my GP about a medication that a friend had recommended for migraines mm. which is Aramig, and um and that that treatment really works for me really works awesome at the right time yeah mm. yeah you got to take it at the right moment otherwise it's, yeah yeah um, yeah it most of the trip tans are a bit funny like that you've got to take them in the window yeah um, if you miss yeah. the window then you know um yeah. you just have to ride out the rest of the attack yeah yeah um so have you ever needed to be on any prevention or you just the trip tans have been enough for you 
I was going to move to prevention, but basically my GP said, look, based on the level of migraine, like I don't get the serious migraine as long as I take it at the right time, tryptans at the right time, we combined with ibuprofen and mm -hmm. usually black coffee. Oh, if I take all three, I know I'm going to recover. Um, so I didn't go on a, I've never been on a preventative type thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, but I guess, and where I refer to it in, in my book, book in terms of living with migraine is that they really increased with intensity and frequency during menopause and mm. it's like the two the two taboo subjects you know migraine and menopause um <laughs> you've got both of them um it's it's really quite interesting you know um in terms of the way i talk about in the context of uh women have been women particularly obviously um have dealt with absences from the workplace, whether, you know, it's mm. premenstrual to have babies, to look after babies, you know, and menopause is not really talked about. And maybe it's, this is, you know, I, as a friend of mine said to me, well, they're sort of the first generation who's probably working the most full time than previous generations mm. of women. It was really quite interesting the way some of the, um, my male colleagues dealt with my absences as a result of migraine they just sort of didn't want to talk about both it was um <laughs> yeah and it was yeah 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 it was quite I think a, a lot of us are going to be able to relate to that you know people not wanting to talk about it um yeah. issue um which usually is followed by being managed out yeah. um <laughs> when you have too many absences which is yeah. something we need to work on because obviously keeping people with migraine at work is a hell of a lot better to, than yeah. uh, us all sitting around on welfare which is not what we want to do all righty so uh, let's wrap this up with what would be your number one tip for people so they can thrive with migraine find the treatment plan that works the most efficiently for you now i know that sounds problematic for a lot of migraine sufferers because you know, if I have a friend, for example, who has the full on, you know, mm. three days of migraine, nothing works. Um, but, but I think if you can find that and not make it take over your life, um, sort of, so I'm dealing with it, but I'm still going to continue with my life. Um, and also, mm -hmm. I, I just think, we don't we still don't know enough about we don't know enough about it um and mm. there are so so many triggers you know just when you sort of think right i've nailed it i've got it you know i won't eat bananas you know or whatever um then then you get one and you haven't eaten bananas for six weeks so i just think it, it does take i'd sort of say don't get impatient with trying to find the triggers and causes because mm. I've been living with migraine now for, you know, um, over 30 years. And I think over time you do, it's, it's like anything in life with experience and obviously better technology, you do, um, you do manage it better. Yeah. All righty. Thank you so much for joining us for Migraine thank Awareness you. Month. Remind us again, when's the book out? July the 7th. It will hit the pages. It's right. uh, hit the bookshelves. It's um. It's actually okay. It's actually five years. And I worked this out. It, it's the five year anniversary from when I was elected. So I told I told the publishers that <laughs> you didn't even plan life. that, did you? <laughs> no. If someone had told me five years ago, you would be doing this in the last five years. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I hope everybody reads it and, and thank you so much again. For Thanks so much, RK. That's great. Thank you.